Good morning. Welcome to Friendship Bible Church's uh, Palm Sunday service. We're so happy that you've invited us into your home today. And uh, just a few announcements as we begin. Uh, we hope you will remember to like and subscribe to this YouTube channel. Uh, also, uh, if you push the share button, there's a small link there uh, that you can copy and paste into any of your social media, Facebook, Twitter, or anything else. And we hope that you'll do that. Uh, we're amazed at how many people are actually tuning in. We've had over a thousand views uh, on our Sunday morning services since we've started live streaming. So uh, there's, a, there's a silver cloud uh, or silver lining inside this uh, pandemic cloud. And that is that the word seems to be multiplying in spite of everything else. Amen. Amen. Uh, just a couple other announcements. Uh, we hope you're going to be hanging up a branch on your uh, door of your home. Uh, it doesn't have to be a palm branch, although here in Florida that's pretty easy to come by. But any green branch will do. And we can do this even though we can't leave our homes right now. Uh, also, uh, I want to let you know that at the end of this, the sermon today, we're going to actually have communion with you. So we want to encourage you to set aside some uh, juice and perhaps some crackers. Uh, really, anything uh, that you have on hand will do. You don't have to run out to the grocery store. Uh, what's important is the symbolism behind uh, the Lord's table. And uh, that way, if you, if you want to do that now, uh, you'll be ready when the time comes. Um, we also want to remind you to continue to give, you know, even though we don't meet here in the building as we normally would, uh, our expenses do continue. Uh, there are three ways to give. Uh, one of them would be to go to our website at uh, fbcma.org or just Google search uh, Friendship Bible Church in Keystone Heights and it'll come right up. And on the left margin, there's a donate button. Just click that and follow the prompts. The second way is good old snail mail, U.S. mail, always works, and uh, our uh, address is there on the website, and you can mail it in, or uh, we still have the office open, uh, just a skeleton crew here, uh, and you can drop that by Monday through Thursday from 8 to 2 p.m., so three ways to give. And on the giving front, I just wanted to share some really fantastic news uh, for the month of March, uh, we've collected our tithes and offerings, and I just want to let you know that we are making budget so far. And I want to say thank you to all of our faithful uh, supporters. Thank you so much. Um, also, uh, we want to remind everyone that while Lake is closed right now, uh, their summer camp is still going to be in operation. And uh, we're very hopeful that by, the, by that time in June that things will be in full swing again there. But uh, if you would like to make reservations either for the Junior Counselor Retreat, uh, June 20th through 22nd, or the Summer Camp, June 22nd through 27th, uh, just register there at the Lake Swan uh, website. Uh, Lord willing, we will be back uh, and able to worship together in the building the 1st of May. Uh, we're praying towards that end and uh, just committing our, our church services to the Lord in that way. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus, whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises, for the promises for you and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourself from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles, to teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayers. So today I want to mostly focus on that last bit, on, in verse 42. More specifically the phrase, 
devoted themselves. It looks like for the foreseeable future, the only ones who are going to bother to show up to church are those of us here now, the worship team, the choir. Uh, the only ones truly devoted, the ones that are going to show up to church even as the civilized world crumbles around us. I can't tell how well that joke is going because it's the room's empty. Um, okay, real talk though. I do want to focus on the phrase, devoted themselves. But I want to make a confession first. We've had two of these live stream services so far, and to be honest, I have not been truly devoting my attention to the service as I've watched from home. I mean, yeah, I listened. I listened to the Randys preach. I listened to the band play. But I wasn't truly devoting myself. I was multitasking. I was eating breakfast, doing homework, texting friends. It's a lot easier to get distracted when you're not sitting in a pew with the pastor there to judge you for staring at your phone the whole service. But what I should, what I, what I should have been doing was truly devoting myself. Devoting my heart and mind to, to what scripture was saying. Devoting my voice to singing along in praise to the Lord. I'm asking God to help me do all that. And I hope you all consider doing the same. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I lift up my, myself and my church family to you. Lord, please keep us all focused on you and what you want us to learn from the message this morning. Keep us devoted to you and everything we do today and every, every day after this. And thank you for your devoted servants here, here that are willing to put in the extra effort to make the service happen. No matter what, in Jesus' name I pray.
thank you, worship team. Let's go now to the Lord in prayer. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains from where my help comes. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Lord, as those words were penned by King David many, many years ago, Lord, they're as alive today as ever. Uh, Lord, during this time of trial, during this time of plague on our earth through this COVID-19 virus, Lord, many of us are challenged to ask the question, where does our help come? And Father, I just pray that we would look to the highest place that we can find, and that is you. And that we would find that you are the maker of heaven and earth, and there's nothing too difficult for you. Lord, we ask that you would quench this virus, stop it in its tracks. But we know that for many there is going to be suffering, there's even going to be death and, and grief. But Lord, we have confidence in you. We know that even in the darkest of times, you can bring us through the affliction that we have. And so we commit ourselves and our loved ones into your care and our planet and our country and our church. And we ask, Lord, that you would be with us, that you would be our help in time of need. And Lord, that you might make each one of us like the bright, shining hope that you are. Help us to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Lord, help us to invite others freely to know who Jesus is. Help us to, to share the things that we have set aside so that others can live also. Lord, help us to give generously to the causes of hunger and the need for research and equipment. And there are so many avenues for doing that. And Lord, I, I just thank you for this church. I thank you for the faithfulness of all the attenders here who continue to give generously. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for the ministry as it continues through the church in spite of the fact that our doors are closed, Lord. Uh, we have received news that many times over more people are actually uh, hearing your word and being ministered to by the congregation of our church, and we just bless your name for that. Lord, as we are about to go into the word with our pastor, we just pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts, that you would anoint him, Father, to speak your words, and Lord, that we would be changed, that we would be encouraged, that we would be blessed, Lord, to, to know that just as Jesus was faithful to come on that first Palm Sunday and present himself as the king of Israel, and indeed the Lord of all. Lord, that his promise to come again is just as true. And Lord, we look for that day. We look for the encouragement of that time when Jesus is going to return and when we will see him face to face, no longer as through a mirror dimly, but we will know as we've been known. And Lord, in preparation for that, we just pray that you'll help us to be faithful. Your word tells us to present our bodies as a temple of the Holy Spirit. And your word reminds us that we do not belong to ourselves, but we've been bought with a price, Lord. And Lord, when we recognize what that means, it's not a hard burden that you put on us because we recognize that we belong to you and you take responsibility for us. And through faith, we have your power, we have your joy, and we have your ability to serve within us. We pray, Lord, that you'll help us to be faithful to that, Lord, to walk in your spirit, to be the light, to be the salt in our time, Lord, just as your disciples were in their time. And, Lord, we are your disciples also. And we know that you're with us because your word promises that you will never leave us even unto the end of the age. So we commit our service to you, Lord. We pray that we'll take every thought captive to the Lord Jesus. In his name we pray and give thanks. Amen. We are really excited to share with you today our song of the month, Raise a Hallelujah. Uh, we had actually planned this for earlier in the year, but um, some other songs came along. And I, I think God is just really good because this song seems very fitting for the time that we're now living in. So please join us. Raise a Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
you say hallelujah? hallelujah? That was awesome. Thank you so, so much. I hope it, at home you're able to, uh, to sing along and enjoy that song. I can't wait to do it for the rest of the month. Well, good morning. And, and what a joy it is on this Palm Sunday uh, to, as it says in the book of Acts, to meet together in our homes, uh, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. It is a joy to bring this Palm Sunday message to you, and uh, uh, I look forward to when we can gather together uh, corporately again, but in the meantime, it is so thrilling to know that uh, God's people are gathered together in their homes, praising Him, praying, reading the Word together, uh, and worshiping together. Our text this morning is the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verses 28 to 40. And as you might have guessed, this is the uh, Palm Sunday, the first Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem as recorded in the Gospel of Luke. So let's pick that up, Gospel of Luke 19, 28 through 40. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany, at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter, find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Tell him, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it, just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, a peop uh, the people spread out their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you as always for the beauty and the wonder of your word. That this is the mind and heart of God given freely to man. We do not have to guess as to your will and your desire. You have clearly communicated it to us and preserved your word down through the ages. We give you thanks in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. My wife and I got a unique wedding invitation the other day from our granddaughter who lives in Kansas City. And because of the recent health crisis, that, uh, that Kansas City became one of the nation's first cities to actually lock down. And that included a temporary ban on weddings beginning on March 24th. Her planned wedding date was April 6th. So she and her fiance uh, got the wedding license and they sent out an invitation to family and friends to join them online for their new wedding date, which by the way is my wife's and mine anniversary, March 23rd. Not exactly what she had planned for their wedding day, let alone uh, their canceled honeymoon to Japan, but they still got married. And Lynn and I were overjoyed to receive the invitation to watch live on Facebook. Wedding invitations all come as announcements. Who's getting married, when, and where? When such an invitation concerns a couple we know well, there's joy and rejoicing just in getting the announcement. And when the announcement comes as a surprise, as this one pretty much did, the joy and rejoicing are even greater. The celebration begins even before the wedding day itself. Lynn and I, and many others invited to enjoy uh, and uh, attend the online wedding were glued to our computers well before the ceremony began. 
Palm Sunday is like that. From the very first Palm Sunday we just read about in the Gospel of Luke to the present day, Palm Sunday is like opening an announcement and invitation to a very special event yet to come. Every year, we draw closer to the event itself, and we celebrate in anticipation of that day. But it's been over 2,000 years since that first Palm Sunday announcement. What is it exactly we are celebrating? What is the upcoming event announced roughly 2,000 years ago we have been invited to attend? Well, we are celebrating the announcement of Jesus as the King of Israel who comes in the name of the Lord. And the inaugural event itself, where Jesus is coronated King of all kings and Lord of all lords, is yet to take place. So we wait in anticipation glued to the current events as they compare to the signs of its approach in Scripture. Every Palm Sunday is or should be like reading over the invitation once again, wondering if this is the year that he may appear. So take a look with me at Luke 19, beginning with verses uh, 28. We'll, we'll take a short bit of this uh, down through verse 35 where the announcement itself is delivered. And notice that according to the announcement itself, the time is not yet. It says in verse 28, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. After Jesus had said this refers to the teaching Jesus had just given in the parable of the ten minas. The point of that parable was to make it clear that the greatly anticipated coming of the kingdom of God was not yet. Other events had to take place first, according to the parable, beginning with Jesus, oh, excuse me, with Israel's rejection of Jesus as her messianic king, her promised Messiah. Jesus concluded this parable by saying this in verse 27, Luke 19. But those enemies of mine who do not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them before me. Yikes. So much for gentle Jesus. Yet it highlights the reality that God over which Jesus reigns will not be filled with rebellious people who don't want him as their king. It also highlights the reality that if you want to be in the kingdom of God, which is another term heaven, you need to be on the right side, on Jesus' side. And you need to be there now. Just as those who refuse to acknowledge the federal government as an authority over them are by definition enemies of the federal government, so too, those who refuse Jesus' authority over them are enemies of Jesus and his kingdom, no matter how right and justified they think they might be. In either case, enemies will be treated as enemies. There will be no middle ground. So, here is Jesus, on his way to Jerusalem, knowing full well that the crowds who had just witnessed the raising of Lazarus from the dead would hail him as the king of Israel, the promised Messiah, and he would do nothing to stop them. He would use this impromptu parade as his formal public announcement and invitation into the kingdom of God over which he would reign as king. Now, while it might be frustrating that Jesus does not give a definitive time for the inaugural event itself, or of his coronation as king, it is fascinating how certain Jesus was of that coming day. It is going to happen. It's also fascinating how certain Jesus was of his rejection as king by the very crowds who were about to hail him as king. When our granddaughter sent out her wedding invitation, she did so with the reasonable assurance that those receiving it would do their very best to attend on 
online. On that first Palm Sunday, Jesus sent out his coronation invitation expecting that most who received it with joy would before long throw it in the trash. Now notice in verse 29 how this first Palm Sunday announcement of Jesus' coronation as king reveals the location of his return to earth for this great event. Verse 29 tells us that as he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, it was no accident that Jesus approached Jerusalem from the villages of Bethphage and Bethany, which sat on the Mount of Olives, east of Israel's capital city. It was no accident that he paused there for a while, waiting for Peter and John to run the errand of retrieving the colt. The Mount of Olives is the very place indicated in the Old Testament prophets where the Messiah would touch down on his arrival from heaven in the last days. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4 says this, On that day, he, meaning the Messiah, will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half of the mountains moving north and half of the mountain moving south. That earth-shattering day is still yet to come. But on that first Palm Sunday, Jesus came to announce his soon coming kingdom in a way that would not be mistaken by those who understood the scriptures and were waiting for the Messiah. By coming to the Mount of Olives, waiting for the crowds to gather and for the arrival of the colt, Jesus was announcing the place of his arrival on his coronation day. The crowds on that first morning got the timing of Jesus' coronation wrong. Supposing the kingdom was about to appear before their very eyes, even though Jesus had just warned them in the parable that was not the case. But they certainly understood the place correctly. No wonder they turned on Jesus after his arrest, thinking they had been conned into believing he was the promised Messiah, never realizing the mistake had been theirs because of their misunderstanding of the timing. We need to pay close attention to this. It is way too easy for us to assume we have God all faith. Only to be disappointed when he doesn't do what we think he should do when we think he should do it. You may be disappointed with God these days because the times we live in are so uncertain. Remember this. Uncertainty is the hallmark of this world not the kingdom of God. Jesus is in our midst. The kingdom of God is in our midst. When the world is in turmoil, Jesus is not. As it says in Hebrews 13, verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let Palm Sunday be a reminder to us all that when we are disappointed in God, the problem lies with our limited understanding of his ways, not because God is fickle or undependable. Panic and feverishly attempting to gain control are the, way, the ways that man responds uh, to times of turmoil and chaos. All the while, God stands like an immovable rock in the midst of a hurricane a shield of protection for those who trust in him as the only one who is holy and trustworthy. It says in Hosea chapter 11, verse 9, For I am God, not man, the holy one among you. So Jesus used that first Palm Sunday as a public announcement. Look at verses 30 through 35. As we saw, Jesus made it clear that the place of his return would be the Mount of Olives, but the time of his coronation was not yet. But he also used this first Palm Sunday as an opportunity to push aside all secrecy concerning the fact that he was and is the Christ, the Lord. The reason he instructed Peter and John to go ahead into the village and to secure a young colt 
was that he would need it for his very public procession into Jerusalem. Go to the village ahead of you, he says in verses 30 and 31, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Well, just as a bride is very particular about the appearance of the wedding invitation that goes out, so Jesus was very intentional about how the announcement of his coming kingdom would look to the public. Up until now, Jesus had kept the news of his coming kingdom out of the headlines in terms of any public announcement. He had taught about the kingdom. Indeed, that was the consistent, overarching theme of all of his preaching and his teaching. Remember this, Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. From that time on, early, early in Jesus' ministry, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. He even routinely suggested through his parables that he himself was the coming king, the promised Messiah of the Old Testament prophets. Matthew 22, for example, verse 2, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. The king in the parable is clearly God, and Jesus portrayed himself as the king's son. Yet in his teaching about the kingdom, Jesus routinely shied away from outright declaring himself as the coming messianic king. In fact, he discouraged his disciples from advertising it. Remember this passage, Mark 8, 29 and 30? What about you, he asked them. Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. And Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Jesus' public announcement of his coming coronation as king began with that brief statement regarding the cult, the Lord needs it. As we see in verse 33, the owners of the cult took exception to these two strangers untying their animal, apparently intending to walk away with it. I mean, that's not unreasonable. I mean, how would you respond if you saw someone just quietly walk up to your car, jimmy the lock, slide into the driver's seat, and start to hotwire it? But what's really interesting here is that the word translated owners, in Greek it's kurios, which more literally translates as lords. The very same word used describing Jesus as Lord. So the whole passage really reads like this. As they were untying the colt, its lords asked them, why are you untying the colt? And they replied, the Lord needs it. The title of the Lord in the Bible always carries the idea of respect for authority. But the extent of that authority is very dependent upon the context. Here, the lords of the cult simply refers to the owners who have complete authority over the cult because it belongs to them. In another context, Lord may refer to God and, and to the worship and love and respect that is due him as the absolute authority over all that exists. In Matthew 22, verse uh, 37, Jesus said, Love the Lord, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. In yet another context, Lord may refer to a wife's respect for the authority granted to her husband over the family. 1 Peter 3, 5 and 6. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God, used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters, Peter says uh, to the women in the church. If you do what is right, do not give way to fear. So when Jesus instructed his disciples to tell the lords over the cult that the Lord needs it, he clearly expected the owners of the cult to recognize that his lordship, his authority, superseded theirs. Even as the, they were lords over the cult, Jesus was lord over them and their cult. 
In doing this, Jesus was making his role as king public, exercising his rightful authority as king over all humanity and all humanity's possessions. It was Jesus' intent that even before he entered Jerusalem itself, with the adoring crowds hailing him as the king who comes in the name of the Lord, that the lords of the cult, along with those standing within earshot of their conversation with the disciples, would be the first to proclaim, all hail, King Jesus. Now as we come to verse 36, we see how the Bible turns our attention from how the announcement of Jesus' coronation was delivered to how the announcement was received. So take a look at, at verses 36 and following. It begins with the lords of the cult who allow the disciples to take the animal. And as the scripture says in verses 35 through 38, they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And John tells us they also cut down palm branches and other branches and laid them on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. As with everything Jesus did, starting down the slopes of the Mount of Olives toward Jerusalem, riding on a colt was very intentional. Not only was he intentionally fulfilling prophecy, but he was fulfilling a prophecy very familiar to the Jewish people because it was recited annually at this time of year as part of the pre-Passover celebration tradition. This prophecy is found in Zechariah 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And the people got it. And they did just what Zechariah had predicted they would do. They rejoiced as they realized Jesus was their king. And he came to them the common people, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on the foal of a donkey. So they shouted and they cheered and they created a carpet of palm branches and the cloaks off their own backs for his path down the dusty hillside road into Jerusalem. Jesus knew full well that his deliberate fulfillment of prophecy would not be lost on the crowds. He also knew it would not be lost on the Sadducees and the Pharisees, for that matter. He knew that the general public would respond the way they did with an instantaneous mass parade of thousands ushering him into the city of David with singing and cheering for Israel's rightful king. That was his plan. And as Luke records the event of that day, he is careful to point out that the words used by the crowds in verse 38 as they celebrated the coming of their king directly reflected some of the very same words used by the angels who first announced Jesus' birth to the shepherds back in Luke 2, verse 14. Remember that? Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. You know what strikes me as particularly beautiful? in this parallel of praise applied to Jesus, then and then on Palm Sunday, is that his entrance from heaven to earth to fulfill his role as redeemer, savior, and king not only brings peace on earth, on whom his favor rests, but also peace in heaven. Or as the Apostle Paul would later put it in Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, in Jesus, and through Jesus to, recon uh, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. 
Of course, all of his praise and adulation poured out upon Jesus that first Palm Sunday drove the Jewish leadership totally nuts. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd, says in verse 39, said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. It wasn't just jealousy over Jesus' popularity that threw them into such a tizzy. It was hearing the crowds yell at the top of their lungs, All hail, King Jesus. They were acting as if Jesus were the Messiah the prophets had foretold, and the Pharisees were beside themselves with the ridiculousness of that claim. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the crowd shouted, quoting scripture. And the Pharisees were dumbfounded that Jesus let them keep it up. Let me tell you something. Jesus loved their praise. He loved their praise. He loved the fact that on this one day at least, the people who shouted his praises were absolutely convinced he was the Messiah the savior of mankind, the prophesied king of the coming kingdom of God. He loved the fact that in their certainty of who he was, they could care less what anyone else thought. All the weight of the religious authorities could not keep them quiet. All the power in the background of the Roman Empire that held no room in their ideology for any king but Caesar could not keep the people quiet. All hail King Jesus. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So what then does that all mean for us 2,000 years later? I tell you, Jesus replied to the Pharisees in verse 40, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. What about you this Palm Sunday? Do you feel the weight of society bearing down on you, pressuring you to keep your faith in Jesus to yourself? And if you're ashamed to admit that your answer is yes, then try this question on for size. Whose kingdom do you belong to? And which king do you serve? There is no middle ground. You can only serve one and not the other. You can only love one and not the other because who you serve shows who you love. King Jesus has sent out the announcement and invitation to his coronation as king of all kings and lord of all lords. The question is, do you want to be there on that day? That day is coming. Jesus said this in Revelation 22, verse 7. He said, look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the word of the prophecy written in this scroll, which now is in book form. And he says again in the same chapter, verses 12 and 13, look, look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. This is Jesus talking. The same Jesus who said, Kill my enemies before me. Jesus says, look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. And I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The first and the last. The beginning and the end. If you want to be counted among the king's friends, not his enemies, when he comes. Let this Palm Sunday be the day you switch sides and give your life and your love and your allegiance to Jesus. It says Romans 10, 13, for everyone, no exception, everyone, no matter what you've done in your past, everyone, no matter how guilty you might feel for whatever you have done and thought and kept secret, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you accept his invitation today, for the very first time. Or, if you've already accepted his invitation, and you know that you belong to him and to his kingdom, I invite you right now, here's a chance for you to respond to what you've been hearing. I invite you right now, wherever you are within the sound of my voice, 
to declare with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Say it with me. All hail King Jesus. Say it again. No holding back. Right there in your living room. All hail King Jesus. Now say it like you mean it. All hail King Jesus. Say it like you don't care who hears you. All hail King Jesus. Blessed is he. Heavenly Father, we hail your Son, Jesus, as King. And we declare ourselves as servants of the King. We thank you, Lord, for sending your Son to die on the cross in our place, because that should have been us. But he took our place. And in exchange, he gave us life. And he reconciled us to you. He forgave our sins and cleansed us from all unrighteousness, making us new creatures in Christ, giving us his own spirit, that he might live within us, that we might live a supernatural life in you. All hail, King Jesus. We thank you this Palm Sunday for what you have done and what you're continuing to do until that day when you step foot on the Mount of Olives and all creation will declare, all hail, King Jesus. In his name we pray. like to invite you to, right there in your homes, to uh, join us in communion. And I want to open this time, again in the Gospel of Luke, it just seemed very, very fitting that we pick up just a couple chapters later in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, beginning in verse 20. And uh, I think my... Uh, Communion elements. Let me uh, try not to get too far out of the camera range here. I'm going to put these right here. As uh, Pastor Randy had mentioned before, whatever you happen to have at home, uh, it is not it is not the material substance that the beverage and the food is made out of that makes the difference. What's in the cup and what you consume represent the body and blood of Jesus. You are remembering, you are reenacting, if you will, his crucifixion, a substitutionary sacrifice in your place when you take these elements. So I invite you to take them and read with me, uh, if you have your Bibles with you, Luke chapter uh, 22, verse 20. Uh, excuse me, we'll start with verse 19. And he took bread, he gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It's fitting, I think, in a very unusual way. It's fitting that we should be celebrating communion together in our homes. Jesus gathered for that first communion in a home. Just a few of them gathered around a dinner table. Very intimate, very private. We're so accustomed in the modern church to doing that corporately and together, and that's not a bad thing at all. But here we get to do it in, in a way much closer to the way Jesus did it the very first time. So Father, we give you thanks in the precious name of Jesus for sending your Son. We give you thanks for providing a means through the cup, through the bread, of remembering the sacrifice, the innocent for the guilty, a sacrifice that was made for us that we might have life and forgiveness eternal life in Christ. We give you thanks as Jesus gave thanks. And we do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus said, this is my body, which was given for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
And after supper, Jesus took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it. Lord, you have made it so abundantly simple and intimate. You have given us a way to remember that touches our senses and reaches into our soul. Thank you for your great love for us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together that beautiful worship chorus, All Hail.